Hi guys, Dr. Dillard. Retro Classroom was not working again, so sorry, this is going on YouTube. This is week nine. It's fall 2020, and it's Wednesday. Here we go. Nail conditions. Uh, we we're going to talk about dermatophytosis today, and we're going to get off of nail conditions a little bit as well. Some very common normal nail conditions, longitudinal ridges and beading. So both of these nail conditions are normal variants of the nail plate. These are not a disease of any kind. Longitudinal ridges are seen in aging people. I actually have some of them myself. Um, not all my fingers, but my thumb has exactly like the picture coming up. Uh, and beading can occur at any age. Right, so here is, that looks exactly like my thumb. My thumb looks better than that even, I think. Better ridges. But it looks exactly like that. Those are longitudinal ridges. It means absolutely nothing. And these are the beads. That's beading. And, yep, that's all I'll say about those. You don't need to get into those further. They're just normal. The matrix is kind of sputtering a little bit and producing some an ecocytes, not a steady flow of them, more of a, a spurt, relax, spurt, relax. Uh, bows lines, like bows, nose, bows lines, like bows speakers. These are a little more troublesome. Um, they are transverse ridges or depressions uh, that are seen. Let's just look at them. There's like somebody took a nail file and filed little notches transversely in the nail plate. So that is caused by something that interrupts the mitosis, the basal cells in the matrix. Remember, anecocytes are born from basal cells and they're ratcheted forward and in the longitudinal direction and those make your nail plate. But if the matrix goes on strike for a day or maybe two days or three days, when it starts up again, it tries to catch up and it overproduces. So you get a divot from where it stopped producing, and then you get a little bump in the back of that divot where it overproduces. And that's the story. They usually show up in the lanula uh, about a week or two after the causative event. And there they are. It's another some better picture. Now when they show up in all of the nails, because they can be, you could get a manicure and end up with these things if they damage the, uh, irritate the matrix. But that would just show if it's damaged and it shows up in one nail. If it shows up in all, this is a systemic event that has shut off uh, mitosis and shut cell splitting here and the creation of these onychocytes, which are nail plate cells. What are the causes of these? Uh, well, as I just said, a rough manicure. If that occurs, you're going to get that in the nail that was manicured. Uh, dermatological, uh, dermatological conditions can do this, especially eczema. We're going to talk kind of around eczema today. I probably should actually have it in a YouTube video on the eczema, how it presents in nails. But I don't think I do that one anymore. I think I have like 15 weeks of lectures. And that one got pushed out of the way. Um, but eczema can uh, do it. And severely stressful events can do it. Major illness, getting COVID-19 and ending up in the ICU. Uh, death of a loved one. Fractured femur. Things like that. Uh, diseases that cause high fevers have been associated with this, like respiratory viruses, um, GI viruses, urinary tract infections can all give really high fevers. Then the scarlet fever, measles, mumps, pneumonia can do it. Uh, it could be a sign of cancer. Uh, inflammatory diseases can do it as well, rheumatoid arthritis, giant cell arteritis. That's the same as giant cell temporal arteritis. What do you know about that? That should ring a bell. Amorosa fuga. Remember that word? Shade drawn blindness. <coughs> Excuse me. 
uh, lupus erythematosus. More causes. Uh, syphilis, not so much around these days. Uh, uncontrolled diabetes. Myocarditis. Pad peripheral artery disease associated with this. Uh, cocaine, penicillin, antipsychotic, antipsychotic drugs, uh, amphetamines, they've all been associated with this. All right, so that's enough of the nails. Let's talk about dermatophytosis and the dermatophytes. Uh, it has a, a very misleading AKA. This is ringworm, and you've probably heard this or seen this or somebody's got, oh, look, they have a rash. It's with ringworm. It has nothing to do with a worm. Uh, but they're a very common group of skin and nail disorders. Uh, they all are caused by a fungus that loves to invade the nail plate and uh, the epidermis, the nail bed, which is underneath the, the nail plate. And they, the causes are, they're dermatophytes, right? Dermatophytes are fungi. So they're members of the dermatophyte family cause this condition. Um, so they all have one thing in common. All, all the different types of fungi cause, uh, they have one thing in common. They eat keratin. Remember our nails are made up of keratin and the skin underneath it is made up of soft keratin and the nails are made up of hard keratin. And they can gobble that stuff up like candy. And the invasion can start an inflammatory process under the nail. It can speed up. Remember, underneath the nail, we have a epidermis. It's short a layer or two, but it's still an epidermis. It has a stratum basale, and it makes, it makes keratinocytes, and they push up underneath the nail plate, and they slough off uh, very slowly. You can't see them coming off, but they do. And the, if you get a fungus under there, it can stimulate that process so much so that you start to get an overproduction of carotinocytes and they slough off really fast and they start to build up underneath your nail and um, yep that's what we're another that's an ecomycosis it can look like an ecomycosis anyway I'm getting off track here um, so these skin infections are often called ringworm which is a misnomer it has nothing to do with a worm of any kind it's caused by the ringworm fungus, which is a dermatophyte. And uh, the most common of these ringworm fungi is uh, a T. rubrum. We'll get to that. I'm trying to stay on my slides. The most common one of these types of funguses, though, is T. pedis, which is caused by T. Uh, rubri. Um, and yep, that causes athlete's foot. Morphology of the lesion. <clears throat> it gets the name ringworm because the lesion kind of looks circular. Uh, and toward the middle, it looks kind of like normal skin. But around the outside, you get this really flaky, flaky look. And it's erythemic. Right? And in here it doesn't look too bad, but out here you have these giant flakes and it looks like a ring, so that's why it got the name ringworm. And it doesn't have to be like that, it might be just something like that. Okay, um, And this is, this is where it grows. This is called the active border and it can grow that way and get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Right, let's look at one. So there's a classic active border. Uh, and you can see the skin looks pretty normal in here. Uh, but this is where the border is advancing, and this is, wants to go this way. T. rubrum is living right in here. Uh, this, this is called tinea corporis, which is if you get a ringworm infection anywhere on the, most of the body anyway, except the back of the hand has a special name, or on the palm of the hand or the palm of the feet has a special name. The scalp has a special name. The eyebrows has a special name. But most of the body, uh, it's um, corpus means body, right? Like the body, the stomach, corporal region. Tinea corpus. <clears throat> okay, so to be, a derma to be a dermatophyte, you have to eat keratin. There's actually three uh, families of this, or generas. 
of these fungi, uh, the microsporum, uh, trichophyton, epidermal phyton, uh, those are the three main fungus uh, keratin eating families there. Um, all of these members of these families, they all eat, they all invade, and they multiply within the carotenized tissue, basically the epidermis of the hair, skin, and nails. That's their target. There's many species. There's 10 different species of dermatophytes within those three genera that cause dermatophytosis. There's 30 of them that, that sometimes cause them. There's an additional 30 of them. Uh, but there's 10 main ones that cause uh, that can cause some of these dermatophyte infections or dermatophytosis. Uh, the king by far, as I already kind of gave away, is the one called T. rubrum, uh, trichophyton uh, phyton rubum, rubrum is the most common by far, trichophyton rubrum. <clears throat> and that causes quite a, uh, quite a few, athlete's foot, for example. Uh, tinea unc. Uh, well, we'll get. Well, let's stay on my slides here. Um, so, how do you name a dermatophyte infection? Well, to to let you know it's a keratin eating bug, you have to say tinea. That will tell us it is a fungus that eats keratin, and then you name the body part that is affected. Okay, uh, that's tinea for tinea. And, yeah, that's sim really simple as that. So, for example, uh, if you have a dermatophyte infection of the bottom of the foot or between the toes, well, it's a dermatophyte infection, so it must be a tinea, and then the word is pedis for foot, tinea pedis. That's, of course, athlete's foot. Who is the bug that causes that? Well, it must be a fungus. It must be a keratin-eating fungus, and it's our friend T. rubrum again. Trichophyton rubrum. Um, on the body, anywhere on the body, like the trunk, the extremities, the face, uh, we said that already, that's tinea corporis. Again, it's usually caused by T. rubrum, or trichophyton rubrum. Um, don't use this for the dorsum of the hand, though, uh, because that's tinea monum, and uh, some other places, so it doesn't work everywhere. How about of the groin region? where the thigh meets the trunk or the inguinal ligament is. Um, that's that's jock rot, we used to call it, or jock itch is the slang names for that. Um, but it's tinea again. It's a, it's a fungus that eats uh, keratin. Uh, and then uh, cruis is the, the region for the groin. <coughs> so tinea cruis, tinea, corpor, uh, tinea corpus, tinea pedis. Make sure you know those, right? The magic three, if there's three on a slide, that's prime pickings for a for a German or from a for a test question. Types of dermatophyte infections uh, continued. If it's on the dorsum of the hand, it's called tinea monum. Mono for hand, tinea monum. If it's on the palmar surface of the hand, uh, strangely enough, you still call it tinea pedis, right? I know that's strange, but that's what you call it. We'll, we'll talk about tinea pedis here in a while. If it's on the scalp, which is covered by hair, that's called capitis, is for skull, tinea capitis. If it's in the beard region um, on guys, it's called tinea barbara. If it's in the nails, uh, it's called anechomycosis, is probably the most common. But staying with the tinea, you could also t call it tinea unguium, tinea unguium, a.k.a. anechomycosis. So these bugs like hard keratin, but they can eat soft keratin as well, as we'll see. Uh, how, do, how is it transmitted, uh, or how do you get catch this bug, or how, what's the mechanism? Uh, the fungus is able to actually break through the stratum corneum, uh, whether it be underneath the nail plate or on the back of the hand or wherever, it can penetrate it because it has an enzyme that it spits. Uh, and it spits out this enzyme called keratinase, which can break down the rock hard keratin uh, no problem. And it can slip underneath that stratum, uh, 
corneum, that outermost layer, and it can get underneath there. It also has some immunoinhibitory mechanism uh, that can fight the body's attack of it. The body has, if it stays in the epidermis, by the way, are there blood vessels in the epidermis? <clears throat> no. Um, some of the white cells, some of the troops can see it there, though, and they can start to invade to try to get it. But it also has this Im immunohibitory mechanism. And these chemicals are, these biomolecules are secreted. We won't get into them. But they go down and they slow down uh, the basal cells in the stratum basale. And because normally every 25 days your skin turns over, right? We've talked about that conveyor belt. Uh, but it slows that down. Um, and therefore, it can't, your skin speeding up, it can't flush the uh, the fungus out of there. Uh, if it's going slow, it can it kind of, because your, your skin's like a river, kind of, right? It's growing, the cells are growing up, and they're sloughing off. Every 25 days, a cell is born. 25 days later, it it's part of the dust floating around your house. Um, so it, it, it's kind of an outward flow would try to sweep the bugs out but if you slow that down the bugs can keep burling down and they can stay there for a long time so skin turnover rate is decreased by this bug let's talk about anicomycosis again tinea unguium tinea of the nail sometimes it's called I've heard it called dermophytic anicomycosis and it is a dermophyte infection, so it's a fungus infection of the nail plate. And the nail bed I can throw in there as well. Uh, it usually hits the toenails 90% of the time. About 50% of the time it can get into the fingernails. And it oftentimes will start out as simple athlete's foot. Uh, and then the athlete's foot is very amenable to treatment. This condition's not. Uh, and you can get rid of the athlete's foot, but it ends up inside your nails. Um, and it is a chronic condition because if it gets underneath your nails and in your nail plate, it's really, really hard to get rid of it because there's no blood there. That's a very uh, kind of avascular area. Uh, there are, so we'll talk about some of the treatments for it. There are some treatments, but they're, that's, you're kind of in the club once you get this. Um, it results, as I said, it if it gets under the nail plate and in the nail plate, the nail bed uh, is stimulated to over uh, to pro to produce keratinocytes too fast, and they are conveyor belted to the top, and you can't get rid of them, and they start piling up under the nail, uh, and then you get that uh, hyperkeratosis, subungual meaning under the nail, hyperkeratosis because of uh, the the response that the body has to these things. Psoriasis can do the same thing. Psoriasis, only psoriasis, ha you get this pitting in the nail. Uh, look, I'll show you some pictures of that in a bit. Okay, who's the bug that causes this one? Like a broken record. Trichophyton rubrum, T. rubrum. Uh, there's another one too, uh, this uh, metagrophyte or metagraphite uh, is also responsible. The big one's T. rubrum though. Again, just this is a fungus like it's T. rubrum, so it, it requires keratin. Uh, that's why it gets the name Tinea, Unguium, if we go with that name. And yeah, they eat keratin. And there are some non dermatophytes, non fungi, that can cause these infections, but it's certainly not typical uh, yeast, and I'm not going to get into that. It's usually in people who are immunocompromised. What's the pre prevalence of anicomycosis? Uh, 10%. That's a lot of people. Uh, and, and the older you get, the more chances you have of getting this uh, condition. And you can see how thick the nails are getting, right, from that hyperkeratosis. Uh, the bug is causing the the uh, stratum basale in the nail bed to overproduce in, uh, keratinocytes. And you can't get rid of them, so they start piling up. Uh, once you get over the age of 40, look at that prevalence. 15, maybe 17% on average. What are the first signs, then, that you have a, a tinea unguium or necomycosis? 
your nail plate starts to get thick. It doesn't look any different. You just all of a sudden, and I had this in one of my nails. I had this. <clears throat> I do still have it. Can't get rid of it. Uh, and exactly how this started, I started looking at it. It's like, God, I'm getting th really thick. I couldn't even get my regular clippers on it. And that's uh, from the hyperkeratosis. And later it can get yellow. Mine never turned yellow, but they can get yellow in color. Some people, they, especially immunocompromised, they can uh, start to get down into the dermis of the nail bed and it can become painful. Um, again, athlete's foot or tinea pedis is very common uh, a starting point for this. And this patient's got athlete's foot tinea pedis and you can see the nails are just loaded with fungi as well so they have tinea unguium aka necomycosis and they have tinea pedis at the same time differential diagnosis has got to be psoriasis of the nails look at that that looks kind of similar doesn't it and it's got some kind of that tofu look underneath the hyperkeratosis here's the difference see the pits that doesn't happen in an ecomycosis. That only happens in psoriasis of the nails. Okay, so they may have psoriatic arthritis in combination with that in the bones beneath, pencil in a cup. Right, we talked about that. Uh, for Reiter syndrome. And can also do the same thing. It doesn't do the pits though. And then trauma can look similar but without the pits. Uh, the Hyperkeratosis can get crazy big. Look at these pink, painted pink nails. And they get just the dermatologist just trim them and look at all that. Um, that's hyperkeratosis. Those are carotino, dead carotinocytes. Uh, and this is ripe pickings too for uh, a nail of this keratin. Uh, so the this is also filled with uh, the T. rubrum. Um, as well. This is psoriasis, but the patients with psoriasis, this is ripe for a concomitant infection uh, of uh, a necromycosis as well. So they, the two conditions can go together. All right, and you take some x-rays, you can see if there's bony changes as well. All right, there's a couple different types of anecomycosis. The most common by far is one called distal subungual anecomycosis, or DSO. And this one just hangs out in the distal, the f the furthest away from the lanula part of the nail. And that's where it hangs out. Uh, it can also get into the the lateral nail bed as well. And as T. rubrum again, the nail thickens markedly in most of these t cases. So this is a, a subungual keratosis. Where does that come from? This is all dead epithelial cells that are coming from the nail plate beneath it uh, that are being produced way too fat. Very similar to psoriasis. Okay, here's a person with distal subungual necomycosis, and really distally is okay. So if it involves just the lateral plate like this, uh, that is still considered distal subungual necomycosis. Uh, this outer portion here, by the way, that's called the hyponychium, right underneath the nail here, hyponychium. Uh, that can be affected. They both can be infected. Right? There's just the parts. Uh, again, I don't know why I put that. And you guys know this already, right? We did an anatomy section on this. Hyponychium is right here underneath the, right where the nail plate meets the far, first part of the nail bed, meeting the real epidermis. All right, and it can get really bad, especially people immunocompromised. The T. rubrum has just eaten the nail uh, completely away, and this can definitely be painful. Notice the proximal part of the nail plate. It's okay. It was spared. Now we go to another type of anechomycosis called proximal, not distal, proximal subungual anechomycosis and like the picture shows this one affects the proximal part of the nail plate this one is a little different uh, and, and it spares the distal part of the nail plate so this is classic proximal sub subungual anechomycosis also typically caused by T. rubrum there's one thing different about this though this this can also start to allow bacteria to get underneath 
uh, in the cuticle area here and the proximal male fold and you can get an infection here uh, so it kind of knocks out the because remember the bung the the bug here has kind of an anti-immune system effect uh, and so bacteria can take advantage and it can start invading the proximal male fold here um, so you can get a cellulitis if it turns red with inflammation and you can get an abscess I'm going to show you a gro gross picture warnings coming up but that has a name that's called paranechium paranechia paranechia so there's a little paranechia just starting here a bit but okay gross picture oh, warning here's acute paranechia uh, which is cellulitis all the red inflammation of the skin she just look at she all her cuticles are gone right she just had a uh, was at the manicurist and the manicurist was too rough or had dirty instruments and allowed bacteria to get underneath here um, and this one is just acute anechium this one she doesn't have the, the proximal anechomycosis though that she's fine she just has acute paranechia all right so how do you treat this stuff debridement 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 uh, you have to take away the food for the bug and cut the bug out as much as you can so you keep the nails super short and get rid of all the food sources for the bug um, that's recommended that should be professionally done on a weekly basis and then there are some medications uh, terbinafine uh, is a antifungal medication uh, for trichophyte and rubrum, there's some research on it. It's been around for quite a while. Uh, it is the most effective treatment that I know of for uh, anechomycosis. And it's pulse dose. You don't need to know much about the dosage, but you should know the name. There's some newer ones I'm not as familiar with. Uh, there are the ones that's not even FDA approved yet. Last time I checked, um, we have itraconazole and fluconazole uh, so, so these are relatively newcomers but uh, as far as I know it's the terbernafine is still the uh, the king why is it so difficult to treat this how come it's so much easier to treat the athlete's foot well you can get medication on the athlete's foot really well and plus your immune system can get to that one but under the nail it's a pretty tough place to be a cell um, even though the nail is porous, right, we said it's more porous than skin, you can definitely medicate it. Um, but, yeah, it's avascular. There's just not any blood vessels in there, so you can't get your troops in there to kill the bug. Uh, there's some other type of anechomycosis. We're not going to talk about these. We talked about the most common types. But there's the superficial white anechomycosis. Um, we talked about the proximal um, subungual anechomycosis. Um, already. Um, oh, I guess I'm just listing them all here. There's the distal. We talked about the distal. Candida is rare. It's usually an immunocompromised. I guess the only one we didn't talk about is these two here. But nevertheless, there are other ones. What are the risk factors uh, for developing a necomycosis? Anything that decreases immune system function or decreases the circulation in the toes, like shoes that are too like pointy shoes, like my wife wears these pointy shoes. Um, not good for the feet. It de decreases the, cons uh, the blood flow, and that can let these bugs get a foothold. Uh, as, your as your age gets, as you get older in age, your immune system function slowly decreases. Uh, trauma, injury to the nail, diabetes, uh, venous stasis, and so it decreases the blood flow. Anything that decreases the blood flow makes it hard for the troops if you have chronic venous and uh, venous stasis in your toes it's hard for the white blood cells to swell uh, to swim through all that swelling so it's harder for them to fight bugs same with pad and immunocompromised is obvious in that one transmission um, so there are spores uh, if you cut your nails the spores are going to be flying all over the place that's why it should be professionally done don't do it on your bathroom floor uh, those spores can live in your carpet or even on your a place where you, you can't get cleaning to. They can live for five years, uh, so they're very hard to get rid of in locker rooms and things like that. So make sure you wash your socks, wear flip-flops when you're in public showers, right, because those spores could be anywhere. 
Let's look at tinea pedis or athlete's foot. Um, this is the most common dermatophyte infection on the planet. Uh, it affects the soles of the feet or the sides of the feet. We'll look at the moccasin, the two distributions, or the interdigital distribution is the web spacing between the toes. It's caused by an invasion of, take a wild guess. You got it, T. rubrum again. T. rubrum is a menace. Um, it could be these other species. It's not always T. rubrum. We have T. interdigitale uh, and T. mentagorphites and E. flaccosum and then uh, T. tonsurans. Those are the other ones that could cause it. You, they, they do recommend, Bologna recommends getting a biopsy if you do have this and it's resistant to over-the-counters uh, because most of the over-counters are, are designed for T. rubrum. So it could be one of these weird ones. Could be the reason it's not going away. There are some non-dermatophytes that can cause this as well, like Candida again. Um, the T. neopetus again, it often presents concomitantly because it's the same bug, right? It's often T. rubrum. So it's not uncommon for them to have an ecomycosis and tinea pedis at the same time, or even tinea monum in the back of your hand, or tinea crus uh, in the jock area, or in the jock area, in the, in the inguinal ligament, in the inguinal region. And down, I mean, around the, the down in the private parts. Tinea pedis, uh, fairly uncommon in females and children, very common in warm environments like the tropic. The, the yeast can breed when it's nice and warm. Uh, it likes tissue without sebaceous glands, so it can't be washed away by sweat, like the soles and the palms of your feet. Um, or for sebum, I mean, not sweat. So... Uh, let's see, it's less common in people who don't wear shoes, because if you don't wear shoes, you're not going to have a nice hot environment for it to grow. There are two types of it, as I said. There's the moccasin and the interdigital distribution of these. Moccasin literally looks like a moccasin caused by T. rubrum. Interdigital is in between the toes. Sometimes you can have one and not the other, but it's common to have both at the same time. I'd say the interdigital is the most common, though. Here is a moccasin pattern of tinea pedis. And, yeah, you know what a moccasin is. It looks like the moccasin. Okay, we can't see him between his toes to see whether or not he has it. Um, here's interesting. You can't really see it that good, but he does have the interdigital uh, tinea pedis. And then when it crawls up on the back, uh, we don't call it. Th this is tinea monum. And why they didn't give that a special name, if it's on the back of your hand or the dorsum of, of your hand, that's tinea monum. Um, but why they didn't give it a special, like tinea footum or something like that, I don't know. But this is this is uh, tinea corporis. This is considered part of the body here. So this patient has tinea corporis and an interdigital uh, tinea pedis. All right, there's classic interdigital tinea pedis there. Got that hyperkeratosis again, right? T. rubrum stimulates the stratum basale to overproduce cells, and you start getting that hyperkeratosis. Uh, risk factors, <clears throat> immunocompromised again, people with organ recipients, HIV, diabetes, those on immunosuppressants for maybe you have psoriatic arthritis or rheumatoid arthritis. Um, there tends to be a genetic susceptibility to these. If mom and dad has it, you have a higher chance of getting it as well. Uh, this is a myth. When I went to school, they used to make us wear these white socks because they thought that the white somehow discouraged the passing of the spores some way. That's a complete myth. It has nothing to do with white socks. I've asked that question before, and people get that wrong. Uh, and it has, it can have, it doesn't always, it doesn't have to, but it can have this really strange clinical presentation called uh, two feet, one hand syndrome. Um, so some people can get the moccasin type in both of their feet and the soles of both of their feet and the palm of one of their hands, but the other palm is fine. Very strange. 
or you can reverse that. Both the palms can have uh, the bug, tinea pendis, uh, and then one of the soul, but the other soul is fine. And that is uh, statistically, significantly, this occurs more often than not. Um, and we don't know why it occurs, but it does present like that. Like this patient had both uh, tinea pedis on both soles of the feet and one palm. Didn't show you the palm, though. Um, and this guy, uh, the other foot wasn't shown, but he had it on both feet and one palm. So you can get two feet and one hand syndrome or two hand and one foot syndrome. What about the treatment? This one is treated much more successfully. Um, it's basically you're going to get an antifungal cream for this uh, or oral fungal uh, medication if that doesn't work. Uh, the newer classes of these over-counters are much more effective than the old ones. Uh, this one called Luliconazole. Uh, has been around for quite a while now. Um, it is prescription only, unfortunately, but it is quite effective. Uh, it's an iminodazole derivative, and it can kill many different types of of the dermatophyte infections, even candida. Um, so it kills tinea pedis, tinea corporis, tinea crus, and tinea capitis. How come it kills? Well, it's all the usually a T. rubrum. So. <clears throat> That's why it's so effective. The over-the-counter ones are okay. Uh, the big one when I was back in the day was this uh, clotrimazole, and that doesn't, it never was super effective. There's a newer one that's supposed to be pretty good called Lamacil, a 1% terabinafine cream. It's over-the-counter uh, twice a day, and uh, a non-manufacturer study, pretty good quality one, showed about 85% of patients were cured in five weeks. Um, so definitely start with this, and that, if that doesn't work, then you're going to have to go with the... Um, then you're going to have to go with the uh, Luliconazole here. Okay, oh, I thought we had more. All right, see ya. Let's see, one more, right? Week 10 coming up. See you later.